Okay. Hi, everybody. So welcome to um, our latest edition of our class on Pierre Vote. You know, after a real marathon weekend of, you know, three day Yantif, two days of Shavuos, Shabbos, and then more Shabbos. And, you know, we've had so much holiness in our lives that the, um, the value and the meaning of, of the work day maybe might have been lost. So to get us back in the spirit, you know, and to, it's funny, there are two reasons to learn Pirkei Avos. One of them we've already talked about. It's the text that's traditionally learned between Pesach and Shavuos. You know, the Omer is a time of paying attention to our character traits and our, and the, the you know, our interior lives and trying to build that up. And Pirkei Avot is about, you know, building up our, our sense of ethics. Um, so that's, you know, uh, and there's mystical reasons behind that, et cetera, we've talked about. And the second reason, though, it's, uh, it's mentioned by some rabbis that uh, Pirkei Avos is, in general, a good text to learn in the summer because the summer is a time of uh, relaxation and a time of, uh, of having fun with friends. And who knows what's going to happen? So you have to learn Pirkei Avos to stay on the straight and true and on the right and narrow. So, um, you know, we're going to learn about the value of work in the summer to resist, uh, to resist the summer's allure of relaxation and uh, not doing your job anymore and things like that. Um, so, uh, no, I, I mean, I'm, I'm saying this facetiously, but I do think that there is really something you said in terms of, you know, when, especially when we're taking so much time off of work, you know, in the summer vacation and the like, uh, or if you've retired, something like that, right? You know, when your time is your own again in a way it didn't used to be, what does it mean to actually engage in a task that you find meaningful and that you can bring yourself to in a worthwhile way? I think it helps maybe from the other side, help us understand what the value of work can be. So we're going to look at a number of Mishnayot from Pirkei Avot that have a sense, uh, that have, have a, let's say, uh, a program when it comes to the value of work. Um, the texts tend to have other elements going on, but we're just going to, I think we're just going to laser in and focus on specifically the elements having to do with work. So let's jump right in. Uh, whoops. There we go. On whoops. All right, everyone see that okay? Fabulous. So we'll start with Shemaya the Avtalion. So, you know, before there were the rabbis officially, right, there were a whole bunch of um, sages and scholars and the like who tended to study in pairs, right, in Chavruta. Um, the most famous of these pairs, of course, is... Hillel on Shammai, never referred to as a rabbi. All right, all, so these are what are called the zugos, the pairs, uh, the friends. So another famous pair uh, are Shammai of Avtalion. Okay, so here comes Shammai of Avtalion, and they come with uh, a teaching. They say, Shammai Omer, Shammai says, Ehov et hamalacha, usna et harabanut, v'al titvadal rashut. He says, love work, hate authority, and do not become known to the uh, powers that be. So, uh, again, we, uh, we're, gonna, we're not going to focus on, let's say, the, uh, the teenager part of it in terms of hating the, you know, hating the man, but uh, let's just focus, we're, we're just going to laser in on the love work element. But it is interesting, right? They says, love work, hate your boss, right? Like, love your task. Do not, though, conflate that, let's say, with the guiding, directing hand that's making you do such things. And also be wary about becoming known to the government. Um, so, interesting libertarian streak, perhaps. Um, okay, so, here comes, so Avot de Rabbi Natan, we've uh, mentioned this text before. It's uh, an early commentary of sorts, a kind of proto-Gemara. Not, it's not officially in the Gemara, but it's a proto-Gemara to Pirkei Avot. Okay, so commenting on Ehova Tamalcha, love work, it says Kate Sad. You know, how are we supposed to do this? So maybe even before we get into the into the into the Avos Rabbi Nosson, maybe we can actually just open this up to all of us. So when it says love work, how do you relate to this very you know you know very terse um, adage, right? You know, a lot of these the teachings in Pirkei Avos are very you know very pithy. So it says very little, but it means a lot. So when it says love work. 
How do you take that? What do you What do you think it means? Better to love the work you do than to hate it. I mean, you should okay, go you in think with it's kind a, of like a pragmatic thing. Yeah, you should go in every day with a positive attitude because it's going to be easier on you and easier on anybody else that you're working with or working for. I think it's pragmatic. Okay, you got to work, so you might as well get along to get along. You got it. Okay, great. Makes sense. Sure. Other readings? That's like, a, let's say it's a reading of necessity, right? You have to work, so you might as well enjoy it. Um, are there other ones that are maybe less, let's say, negotiated? Something more like positive, well, like from the outset? Yeah. There's the whole like working's good for the soul, like, mm -hmm. you know, like, idle hands of the devil's workshop. Yeah, it's good for you. It makes you feel productive and part of society. And okay, well, here we have two things, right? One is that working is good for the soul, which seems to be that working is inherently good, right? It, it benefits you directly. Another one is that it. Well, the second part of it was more, let's say, um. There's an extrinsic value, right, that you're contributing to society in some kind of way. So it has some kind of internal benefit in terms of it building yourself up in some kind of way. There's an external benefit in terms of contributing, right, to the society in which you live. Um, okay, great. Other readings? You know, very important no it doesn't say love your job it says love work and i think one of the important things that like for instance feminist critics have brought to discourse around work is that right life is full of work is that some of those things are you know seen as jobs or as compensated by some kind of boss and it's interesting that shemaya says you know love work but hate hate the authority i.e work is actually something that's not defined just by being in a power structure in an employment arrangement work is rather something that we're constantly doing in our lives right parenting is work obviously um there are other kinds of work too you know if you are providing let's say you know if a friend of yours is in trouble and you are supporting them that's a certain kind of work right now like i think we the reduction of all work to be something that's compensated right actually you know, it cheapens the fact that life is full of I think labor, right? Things that take effort, things that apl that need applied attention, right? And then that demands, in a sense, um, you know. I think the spiritual element that Susie was gesturing to, um, you know, that work actually, you know, you could say maybe it's ne necessary, maybe it's not, in a sense. You know, it's necessary in the sense that we're living. It's not necessary in the sense that no one's going to force you, right, to do something. Um, Okay, so at Hovod Malacha, Avod Rebbe Natan says, Kate Saad, knew how, right? Melamed, it teaches us. Shiyehe Adam Ohev et Malacha, Aval Yasune et Malacha. Right, this is kind of actually what Lauren's getting at. Teaches that person should, you know, like like their work, and you should not like it. Okay, fine. Shame. This is very interesting. Shia Torah Nitna Bivrit. Kach Hamalacha Nitna. Bivrit. Just as Torah was given with a covenant or in a covenant, along with that, work was given in that covenant. What's the proof text? As it says, Sheishis Yamim Tasim Lachtecha. Right? Sheish Yamim Tavod Vasisas Machtecha. Yomashvish Shabbas Lashan Lakecha. Right? Six days you should labor and do your all of your work. And on the seventh day, Shabbos, a day for God, for you to rest. Meaning what? Um, it means that if you don't work, then there can't be a Shabbat. Mm -hmm. There can't be a Shabbat unless you, have, unless you work during the week. Right, there's a famous Talmudic passage that says, only somebody who toils in the sixth day will for the six days is going to eat on Shabbos, right? Unless you go to, you know, uh, Fortino's or whatever, right, and get your Shabbos groceries and you cook the meal on Thursday night, Friday, whatever. You're not going to eat on Shabbos, right? No, like there's like coming something obvious to that, but there's something larger than that that it's saying, right? That Shabbos only works if it is the result of applied attention and effort. Okay, good. So Shabbos requires six days because with uh, the six days there can't be Shabbos. How else can we see? Like, well, let's keep on pushing it. 
know, that model still has like, the, the, the point of Torah is Shabbos, right? There's a mitzvah to do Shabbos. And the six days are, you know, the Shabbos is the ikr, it's the essence, and the six days are the tofel, right? They're what, like, support it and surround it. But the telos, right, the tachlis is Shabbos. Fine. Is there a way that's actually not just the unipolar? It's not just about the ikr of Shabbos, but maybe bipolar? Or dipolar, maybe? <laughs> I don't mean um, that it's bipolar, but yeah. I don't know what, uh, I don't know if this is what you mean, but. Um, I don't know what I mean either, so. I think the, the, the Torah was given, like, we aren't just meant to, like, sit around. So mm -hmm. We are meant to be here for a reason, and, like, the Torah gives us guidelines on how to labor. In this world. Mm. Like you said, it's not maybe just, it's not just uh, like an employee employer relationship. Mm -hmm. There's things that we do that are mitzvot. So, like, mm. like, and those can be laborious, as you alluded to earlier. Mm -hmm. Great. So, I mean, you know, just like in a way that the Gemara says, the Talmud wasn't given to angels. It was given to Ben Adam, right? It was given to human beings, right? To, to an angel, Torah doesn't make any sense. Right? An angel doesn't have to do all the things the Torah makes sure we need to do or gives us ways to navigate doing. Similarly, you know, Shabbos is an incredibly important aspect of the Torah. You know, without Shabbos, you know, we wouldn't have anything. But Torah isn't given just for Shabbos, right? You know, famously speaking, the Torah has minimal to say about Shabbos. You know, the Talmud describes Hilchus Shabbos, the laws are about the Sabbath, as being a mountain suspended by a hair. There's very little in the actual Torah about Shabbos. Right? But there's a huge body of literature that extends from it. So what's in the rest of the Torah? The other six days of the week, right? Like how to live your life, how to do these mitzvot, which require you to do malacha, right? For you to do labor. I mean, Shabbos, remember, what are you not allowed to do on Shabbos? Work, right? So we have Shabbos and then there's malacha. They both exist. One can't do without the other. So if and do we get where it's going? Just like Shabbos was given in the bris, in the covenant. Malacha was given in the covenant as well. Right? Just like we have the Sabbath, right, which is the core, really, of the Jewish religion in so many ways. But Malacha was given as part of the deal as well. Work. Labor. So, right. So we can think of that in the way that Rene just gestured towards, that it's a Vaitis right? It's holy work. And you know, that's the name of the source sheet. Right, mitzvahs, right? Mitzvahs require you to do holy work, giving tzedakah. That's business, right? Mecca humemkar. You're not allowed to do that on Shabbos. Um, wrapping tefillin. You don't do that on Shabbos. You don't do that on Yantif. Uh, for a lot of people who don't even do that in Um Writing a Torah, writing a mezuzah, right? All these things are work that you do. Okay. But what about non mitzvah? Yeah. Where does studying Torah fit into that? Is it considered labor? Pause. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what if I were to tell you, Susie, that the main way that a lot of these texts are interpreted by the rabbis is that work is studying Torah? Would you be surprised? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, so I want to go through, let's say, a more broad reading of it. Then I want to go along with the rabbinic reading of it, that kind of, you know, it's a rabbinic rereading of it, a sort of, you know, rabbinic work, i.e. Torah. And then I want to actually come, I want to like draw back from that and see actually how are we able to reapply that maybe in our, in all of our lives, even if you're not like a, you know, professional nerd like yours truly, like how in your own Torah learning or in your, let's say in the holy work that you do in your life, right? How can we actually learn from Torah and apply it to that as well? And then hopefully that, you know, spills over back into Torah too. Um, but I think part of the, maybe even the deal that the Avos and Rami Nassim getting is not just doing mitzvahs is laborious, but also, just like Torah and Shabbos were given as part of the deal, so was work, right? So was work, doing things, right? Living in the six days of the week. That's actually part of the deal of Torah, too. It's, you know, these, some of these texts are very 
politically deployed, especially in terms of certain debates in the contemporary state of Israel about who has a job and who doesn't, and who sees Torah, perhaps, as the whole sum total of what one should be doing with one's time, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we are not going to go there, Lauren. We are not going to go there. But we, uh, but you'll see a lot of these texts actually show up if you look at, like, some of the political literature around that. Hmm? What? I, I, yeah, you picked the right. Sorry, I don't understand. Definitely, I'm somebody who's not happy with all that. So we don't <laughs> get into the politics. Yeah, no, it was, it's, it's, no yeah, I was just gesturing it. We've had that talk before. Uh, no, so this is the thing. We're not. I, I don't want to talk about jobs. That's like what I don't want to talk about. No way. Because I think to make to reduce this to being about a job means we miss the way, again, actually, we miss, again, that feminist critique of the way in which compensated labor is the only labor that gets recognized, and I think that's actually a real problematic thing. But B, uh, I mean, you know, the whole, it, look, feel free to look into the notion of, like, wages for, wages for, for, uh, for, for housework and things like that. But, um, but besides that, I want to actually look at work as, in a way, actually kind of what Susie was gesturing to, and Renee as well, a spiritual practice. Like, in, in a way, like an embodied expression of a spiritual, of a spiritual life. And that Torah here is saying that Shabbos is part of our lives, and that's a day in which we are spiritual creatures. We are meant, you know, intellectual creatures. We study, we pray, and we enjoy, right? That's enjoyment's another thing your soul does. But the six days of the week are also part of the deal, in which we use our body to achieve goods in the world, right? To, to manifest God's will. Right to bring our society more towards justice and equity, to manifest compassion. Right, all of these things require you to do work. Right, to organize, to distribute, to uh, to deploy. Right, like you can't steig your way into making sure that you know starving people have food. You need to get them food. Um, so along comes Rabbi Akiva, and he says, "I'm there." Itim she adam ayse melacha u mitnatzel min hamita. Yeah, no, we're not going to do the Rabbi Kiva thing. Sorry. All right. Um, yeah, so I think the value we can see here from actually, we're going to skip down to Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar. How are we going to get into the whole thing about? Uh, <laughs> about who's liable for death. Um, so Rabbi Shimon Elazar says this. A very interesting set. Um, he says, "Af Adam Harishon lo ta'am klum ad asam lacha." He says, "You know, Adam, you know, the first human being, did not taste a darn thing until he did work." Shnemar, v'yani chehu began Eden lo ovda. Ulushomra, God placed Adam in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Okay, so Adam was on Adam's program. Even I mean, this is the thing. It's a little bit counterintuitive, right? Because when you think of the Garden of Eden, you think of pre-civilization, right? You think of not needing to strive or to toil. You know, when we think of work vis-a-vis -vis the Garden of Eden, what do you think of? You know, primarily. Are you thinking of the curse? I think of no. I think of no work. Like they right. just, you know, they took right. some fruit and right, and bunch yeah. of dirty hippies. Yeah, yeah. You know, and the, the 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 Talmud says actually that in the Garden of Eden, like the 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 tree tasted like the fruit. You didn't have to like the world produced for you. You ate the fruit, you like stripped off some bark, yum yum yum. You know, you could only like chomp your way into a tree. Not a lot of work was required, right? You didn't have to like figure out complex agronomy. But and you I mean so and what I was gesturing to is that work I would associate first and foremost vis-a-vis -vis the Garden of Eden with the curse. Right? God says, by the sweat of your brow you shall eat. Right? Agricultural work is the curse, and that's why Noah, ten generations later, is his name means comfort. Why? Because he invented tools. He invented, uh, like, ag agricultural tools, which made people's lives easier. He alleviated the curse. Work is the curse. You know, the Bible's the first, like, uh, anti-work text, right, in that way. But, 
here comes the rabbis, right? Rabbi Shimon Elazar, he says, no, 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 no. Even in the Garden of Eden, in which, let's say, maybe jobs are the curse. No jobs in the Garden of Eden, right? No authority structure. It's just Adam and Eve, right? Utopian non-society, pre-society. But even in there, there's still work in some way. It says God placed Adam in the Garden of Eden to work it and to ten mend it, tend it, keep it, guard it. So even if, let's say, strife, toil, things like that were not required, but there still is the work of maintenance, of care work, right? The hadar mikol etzagan achol tochel, the beauty of all the trees in the garden, eat, eat from it, right? But work is part of what it means to have then permission to eat. And then Rabbi Tarfon comes along and says, this sort of really blew my mind when I saw it. Even God did not cause God's presence to dwell or to rest on, you know, on Israel, i.e. to dwell amidst Israel, until they, Israel, did work, as it says, the asuli mikdash v'shechanti v'seicham. Make for me a sanctuary, and I will dwell within them. Meaning what? How do you take this? I mean, I'm thinking too that what you can't do in Shabbat of the 39 melachot right. that were involved in building the Mishkan. Right. So um, Hashem was waiting for the people to be an active part of the covenant by making him a dwelling place. And that was the where during the week. And then come Shabbat, they could rest and Hashem could rest with them. Though according to this, Hashem didn't rest until they like completely finished the Mishkan. Oh, that's so, that's beautiful. Right, so you're saying, in a way, it's modeled after Sheshes Yamim, you know, Tzad Kol Nachtecha. You know, Right, yeah. first you have to do the work, and then you and God can rest, you know, with each other. Yeah, like a partnership. Mm, lovely. Okay, other readings? Davar Acher. Yeah, Susie? Well, the problem I'm having is like from that first line that it says like, oh, hide from your boss, like, like the work, but don't like your boss. Yeah. But like, Hashem's kind of being the boss, right? Or is Hashem the boss? Yeah. Hashem is the boss. Like, everything we're told to do is coming from Hashem. That's true. I mean, it's so, you know, Ahovaz Malacha Snei Es Harabanus. Funny enough, it's the same word that's for rabbis. Hate the rabbi, hate the Rabbanut, right? The Rabbanut is the name for the chief rabbinate of Israel. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's the thing, though, is that it is, I mean, we, you know, we call, we call God Ribon Kol Olamim, but we don't tend to use that word Rabon, Ribon, to mean God as much. I think there is like an important distinction being made between human and divine authority. Um, right? And besides you, there is no king. Um, but it's, you know, it's an interesting point. It's 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 interesting. It's an interesting intervention you're making. I hear think here though, um, what we see as well as this notion of let's say earning God's rest, or that rest requires the work of what it means to do. But it's, you know, God is with us in terms of resting. I think well, yeah, isn't that and that is quite interesting. Do you want to say more about that? I was going to go in a different direction, but that that's that's an important thing to note. Well, like. You know, and then on the seventh day, God rested, and then on the seventh day, man rests. Like it's, it's like it's the one thing that we do together that we. Yeah. Right, right. It's, really Shabbat Shabbat Shabbat. Shabbat. right. it's God who rests, quote unquote, and is refreshed. Isn't that interesting? So, but it's also like the one thing that we do simultaneously, and well, I don't know if we do it in the same way because we don't really know what God does, but like. 
the intent is certainly the same. Mm -hmm. To like mm -hmm. re rebirth yourself and rejuvenate. And re mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like where we get to be the most like. Right. Right. And it's interesting too, right? Because like, obviously God doesn't need to rest or rejuvenate God's self. But on the other hand, we see that God provides the precedent for us resting, right? That creates this black line, right? This bright line between the six days and Shabbos that cannot be violated, right? Protecting the worker, protecting human beings need to rest, not to be under someone else's thumb all the time. Right? Hate the authority. But, you know, in some ways then it says, ah, okay, so the day of rest then is the day of godliness, the day of holiness. And I'm not in any way, shape, or form denying that, okay? People watching this, YouTube or whatever later on, do not twist my words. Do not snip out this little part and say that I said that. You will not get me in trouble. But rather, what I am saying is, you might have thought, Zahavamina, ah, so Shabbos, resting then, is a day of communion with God. That's true. But also then this imbues the work that proceeds and, and follows from Shabbos and succeeds from Shabbos to also then be a day of spiritual and uh, religious significance. Right? It's not that there's the six days which are meaningless and then Shabbos, which is everything. Rather, Shabbos is everything, and also the six days of work are also something as well, something meaningful and something valuable in their own right. Because God says, I'm not going to rest with you until you're able to see, and this, is, I think, is the key, and this is the point, and the pedagogical point made with Adam as well, that your involvement is important in this world, is needed and necessary. For you to take action and provide for yourself, to take care of the environment, to make sure that the food system is working, to make sure that there is a space for me, God, to dwell in, you are needed, says God. You are required. And I think that's an element here as well, is that there is, in its way, uh, a powerful element of the ennobling quality of work to see that work is uh, our ability to intervene and our ability to uh, direct ourselves make plans and then fulfill those plans through our abilities and our capacities is something that is valuable and uh, has i think tangible benefit in the world and also redounds right it trickles back to our own spiritual and personal benefit as well. Um, yeah, Renee. Um, well, I think I was just going to say what you just, <laughs> just said, actually, but I'll say it in a different way, maybe, because mm -hmm. um, this last verse in Exodus 25, 5, make me a mm -hmm. sanctuary, and I will dwell, I think you said the translation is within them? Yeah. Correct? So we talked about this verse before and yeah. how it's more the like, him love this verse. Yeah, that it's that it's not only like a physical building, but it's a spiritual it's spiritual building as well. Mm -hmm. And so I guess uh, like from beginning to end, uh, what they're trying to say is that physical work somehow begets spiritual work, mm. and somehow begets. A relationship with with God. Beautiful. That's a great. That's a great way of putting it. It's very elegantly put. Yeah, you know. So the Hasidim, you know, the Sfas Ms at least, and I'm sure earlier Rebbeim as well say, She says they shall work and make. They will make me a sanctuary, and I will dwell amidst them. And says amidst them, literally, like in them. You know, Sfas Ms saying God will dwell in you. Like in you. And I think exactly what you're saying, like build spiritual building. You think, of, oh, God, build the temple, build the Mishkan, and God will dwell in it. Fine. But rather, using your body, using your, your mental capacity, your mental faculties, using your spiritual faculties to achieve something tangible in the world, that is, in a way, building a, a sanctuary of yourself. And that actually becomes the space in which God resides, through you doing meaningful work. 
you become that sanctuary because you have sanctified yourself because you have drawn on the faculties that God has given you. It's an incredibly subtle reflexive act. In the working, in the building, you are built. There's a term for this in German, fe, but whatever. Bildung, a Bildungsroman is a type of novel that is about actually how a person becomes themselves, like goes through a journey to develop themselves. Bildung, it comes from the word to build. All right, we are building ourselves. We are building, and insofar, and in, and insofar we are building, we are built. We are building ourselves. Okay. The Bartonura, Renaissance Italian commentator, one of the biggest commentators on the Mishnah, he says, love work. Um, you know, actually, uh, Ellen uh, was telling me that in her learning of Hebrew grammar, that uh, was learning about this word et. So here's a great example. Ehov et malacha. So ehov is done, is in the sivui, which means the uh, command form or the justive form, right? Do it. Love, work, and et demarcates the, uh, the, the, uh, the direct object. So love, work. Great. Grammar. You know I love grammar. Afil yeshle vima lehis parnes, even if one has enough to live on. Chayav lasok melacha. You still need to do work. You still need to be engaged in work, busy in work in some way. So we talked before about, let's say, positive need for work. From either the necessary nature of it, as Lauren was getting at, which then we saw in the Vosta Rignosim, that got to work, so you might as well like it. And then as it moved on, we saw that actually there's a positive value to work that has nothing to do with necessity, it's because actually work itself is inherently valuable because it is ennobling in some way and it is able to create uh, a space for God to dwell and recognizes then the gifts that we have to be sanctified and devoted to a holy purpose. Here now we have, let's say, a dialectical reading of this. Love, work. Why? Because not working is dangerous. Okay? So, again, I want to be very clear. This does not mean not having a job. It is rather saying not being occupied. Okay? Not employed, but not being occupied. Why? Because, uh, because laziness, idleness, no, uh, idleness is not laziness. Oslis is a different thing. Idleness, not doing stuff, brings you to dullness. Okay, this has to really, this is existential in a, in a way, because it is saying, and, and I can, I, you know, I think one of, the, you know, one of the greatest challenges of this age is the, is the seduction, right, of, let's say, spectation, right, being drawn into something that is busy, but that achieves little, whether it is what David Graeber calls BS jobs, of David Graeber, blessed memory, called BS jobs, you know, work that occupies your, t you know, people are at their jobs for like hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, and how much productive time do they actually have, like two hours a day, something like that, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, depreciating, you know, it's, 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 it dissipates yourself. But not just that, right, also the ways in which there's all these aspects of our leisure lives, our free time now, in which we are being, things that feel like work, but make us feel terrible, right? I mean, staying on top of the news, or, you know, staying, you know, getting, you know, uh, seduced by social media and things like that, right? To be able to use your time well has become harder. So I'm not here, like, finger-wagging and tut-tutting. Saying, how dare you? I am as guilty of this as if I'm probably more guilty of it. And thus, it is the challenge of our time to not be drawn to Bittel, right? You know, back to the rabbinic rereading of this, Bittel Taira is like the greatest uh, tragedy in the yeshiva world, like not learning. But I want to talk about Bittel Malacha in a way. And Bittel Malacha, ironically, right, wasting job, wasting work, work that wastes you, work that doesn't use you well even, right? Waste, bitzel malacha can even exist within the, you know, the world of employment because of all these just nonsense that, that, we're, that we're required to do for no good reason. 
So I think as much as Barton Noir is a critique, it's also in a way a, a mission statement. Work, and again, whether that's in the context of a job or in the context of all the other venues of our life, which require our, you know, our, our focused attention and our, and our deployed efforts, um, should be something that is within... Yeah, no, so, yeah, that's a great point, Lauren. It's a great point. Uh, Lauren's noting that retirement, you know, we, it's usually seen as something that's like, oh, it's enjoyable. You know, it's nice. You get some time off, right? You worked hard all your life. Now you get kicked back and relaxed. And I mean, there's truth to that too, right? I think enjoyment though is work too in its way, right? Uh, the question though is, um, you know, I think like, I think thinking of work in terms of something that brings us into, into touch with something meaningful, right? And then the question is how much of work as we see it is doing that. Um, but you know, like the fact that's what like, it's so important to have things like senior centers, retirement centers, um, book clubs, you know, things that keep, you know, that, that, that fill people's time meaningfully, not just, uh, arguing over using the pickleball, pickleball courts, but you know what, pickleball, that can also be fun too. Um, okay. So back to Avot Rebbe Natan from the same passage, but later on down, it says, Rebbe Yehuda ben Betera says, Mi she'en lo malacha lasos ma yase. If someone doesn't have work to do, what do they do? Im yesh lo chatser chareba, o sade chareba. If they have a courtyard or a field that fallen into dis into a dissolute state, yelech vit asek ba. Go, do something with it. Shnemar sheishes yamim tavod vasisa kol malach techa. Whoa, that's interesting. So now, as we kind of saw a hint of that before, it's not just like a description, it's a prescription. During the six days, do something. Um, so what is the Torah saying when it says, I could have just said, do work. All of your work. Why all? Because it includes, you know, people with fields and or courtyards, right? And that they can do something with. I.e., back to what, uh, back to what the Bartonura is saying. It's not just out of necessity that you're working, but rather because you have a chance to do something. You have resources before you. Are you going to actualize them? Or are you going to make sure that they're able to be in the state that they can be? You have a field. What could that field be doing? It could be growing food for your household, for other people. You have a courtyard. What could that courtyard be doing? Could it be a place where people need to, you know, there's a space where people can gather. It can be a space where you can host events. You, you could make what you have do something good. So sheishis min tesa komachtecha, vasitza komachtecha is not just a description, but it's actually uh, uh, you're being charged with a responsibility. You have blessings in your life. You have potential in your life. Are you letting it lie fallow, or are you going to help it become what it can become? And that I think applies equally as well to your fields and your courtyards. If you have these things, you know your front lawns, back lawns, whatever. Or, what about our own faculties, the, the fields of our soul, right? the things in us that can produce, that we've let lie fallow? And I say pause, reflections, objections, comments and questions. Um, I think in a way that this is also saying, you know, don't procrastinate. Like, there's always work to do, mm -hmm. and you shouldn't just sit around. Or if there's, mm -hmm. you know, or if there's obviously work in front of you, like like yard work, which nobody wants to do ever. So <laughs> it's like, you know, don't put it off. You have something to do. You should, you should get it done. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, very much. Yeah, so that's definitely part of this, like, you know, idleness leads to dullness element, right? Is putting, you know, I am a champion procrastinator, 
And it often has to do with like how overwhelming something feels, right? Oh, here's this big thing I need to do. And it's like, ah, oh, I don't want to do it. And then finally it gets, you know, it's like, I have to do it. I have to do it. And then I finally do it. But then I've tried to train myself out of this and with, you know, varying levels of success. And approaching something methodically, step by step, which I'm able to chunk it, right, to, to break it into manageable, manageable pieces, and then I'm able to, in a way, not just achieve something in a way that's less stressful, but also actually savor the process in its way. It's a very different way of relating yourself to things that you need to do, or things that are worth doing. I mean, it's interesting, too, in terms of, like, what is this so fallow field, this dissolute, dilapidated field? You know, I think when you think, oh, you got to do your yard work, i.e., you have to make sure that the lawn meets the standards of the neighbor of the tenant of the neighborhood association, right? So they don't get mad at you and call the whatever. But what? Else, but I mean, why do we have lawns? What are they doing? You know, there's actually this kind of like anti-grass movement that started. You know, like what? What are lawns just wasted space? You know, what if they were producing food, right? What if, um, or what if they were pollinators? You know, all these things, right? We have like these grass which does nothing, does nothing. Uh, so. Something to say. Something to think about. Um, so, um, here's a really interesting muscle we get from Rabbeinu Yonah. Rabbeinu Yonah is a was a medieval rabbi who uh, wrote a few, fa you know, his two famous texts. One is his commentary on Pirkei Avot. It's become a real classic. It's print. It's been many, many, many printings. Another is uh, his book called Shari Tshuva which has his book on tshuva, right? So he is somebody who's really, you know, he's a, he was one of the early Musser writers. He's a writer who's deeply concerned with ethical questions and questions of how to, you know, build ourselves. He says this, Shemaya Mara Heaven Melacha, Ahoven Melacha. Shemaya says, love work. Shalo Tivatel Adami Melacha. That one should not refrain or be idle from doing work. Okay, again, so there's work versus bittel. Melacha versus bittel. Avoid being bottle. How? That is to say, Kasher hu margil evarav lihit batel melacha. Once it becomes habitual for your limbs, i.e., for your body, right, to be idle from work, man nu yadav ki ahergel sholet alehem. Your hands, i.e., your faculties, will refuse to do or protest. They will object to you doing work because it's become so. Because the the habit has become regnant, right? The habit has ruling over them. The Amru Alav Eid, and it quotes from from Proverbs, Mechoref Atzel Lo Yechrash Shal B'Katsir V'Ain. It says, from the winter, the lazy person does not plow, i.e. the idle person doesn't plow, and then when the harvest comes, they look for food and garnished. Nothing. Now, that, you know, that verse is kind of, you know, like a lot of Proverbs, very practical advice. Right, the idle person doesn't harv doesn't plow from the winter, and then when the harvest season comes, the land has not produced any food. And there's something interesting because it seems like you know, doesn't do the thing, goes out looking for the result, no result. What? <laughs> right? Why hasn't this happened yet? Shehu <laughs> choshev. What? That seems dumb, right? Shehu <laughs> choshev. The the Atzo thinks. When the person ref re refrains, thinks to himself, ah, I'm going to sit idle from work because it's nice. It's nice. Vuhu hefech! No, adravut! The opposite that's true. Ki v'yegiya yeloi malacha. Because it's only through through toil, through effort, that rest comes. Ki mipnei hachoref yanuach v'yamod beveto lo yachrosh. Because of the winter, chills at home, stays at home, doesn't plow. And then when he looks, shal b'katz yir l'asayf etfu v'ayin v'yamos barav. Then he goes out in time of the harvest, right, to, to, to gather the, the produce. Nothing's there. And he dies. I don't think this is exactly one of those subtle lessons. Uh, he, he starves to death. Seems like that could have been avoided. 
Aval hachoresh bechoref, but the one who plows in the winter. Avad admasa yispolachem ki ein adam asig nucha ach bigia techale. One who works the land will be satiated with bread, satisfied with the bread, because a person cannot really attain rest. Menucha, Shabbos, Menucha, and uh, we have this dialectic again. Ach biyagiyat chila, only through hard work, effort beforehand. Okay, so just tell me back. What's the mashal? What's the, what's the parable? The analogy? Work brings rest. Uh huh. What work specifically? Just give me the give me the give me the mushle first before we get to the to, before we get to the nimshal. Oh, sorry. You are a. What? You are a work. You are a farmer. Okay. Good. Along comes the. Winter. Good. And you are lazy. Boo. And you're like, ah, oh, it's cold. And you stay at home. You don't plow. And then along comes the harvest and? Nothing. Nothing. Gorgeous. Okay. So, now the nimshal. Now let's decode it. Well, it's, if, it's interesting because I thought they were going to go in a different direction with it. Like, I thought mm -hmm. they were going to say, so if you kind of like, you don't. You don't mean it's winter, right? So you think there's nothing to do, but really you should be maintaining your field so that like everything's prepped and ready to go in the spring. I think that's there too. And and then when you don't, now suddenly you have to really hustle and work ten times harder because uh -huh. you have to, to get your fields to to be fruitful, right? But instead uh -huh. they're like, but if you had just instead they're like, but if you work hard, then you'll actually want to rest. Like your body will need the rest, kind of thing. Like, I don't. It was. It wasn't the way I was expecting it to go. I mean, it's well, I think, it's yeah. I mean, I don't think this text would fly in today's like hustle and grind culture, you know? Uh, like, wake up, I gotta get that grind set going. I don't know if you're familiar with all these like memes and stuff of like people are just like, you gotta hustle, hustle, hustle. You gotta, you know, make your first million by the time you're 25 type of people, right? Um, but, you know, you'd think that maybe it could be, listen, you know, like, fine, you let one chance go by, but you know what, you fail to, all failures are really, you know, problatunities, and you learn from them, and you, you, you can, you know, you can make up for it. Um, agriculture doesn't work that way. You need to plow at the right time so you can plant at the right time so that there's rain at the right time, and then there's produce at the right time. Now, I'm not saying if you don't, if you miss a harvest or you can adjust by planting other kinds of seeds and you can shift the seasons, you know, shift the, the, the stages and things like that. That's true. There's some adaptability. But to your point, Susie, the winter seems like a time of fallowness, but actually what seems like an empty time is a time for you to get ready for what is to come. Right? Because while the ground is doing nothing, you need to then help the ground get ready to do what it must do later on. So what's our winter in our way? Right? One thing that really typifies this Otzel Butzel person is that they are a short-term thinker. The winter is cold. I am tired. I'm staying home. Why? Because it feels better. Menucha lo. It's more pleasant. It's more relaxing. But what's missing is a systematic kind of thinking that sees things long term, th sees every piece in its place. You only can have, let's say, call it sustainable rest once all the pieces are in place. You rest after the harvest, not before. There's rest in your life, but you have to work six days to have Shabbos. And I would say specifically in times in which it seems like the easiest thing to do might be to give up. Those are precisely the times, actually, in which it's worth trying to dig in. And I don't just mean this in this kind of like grind and win kind of psychosis, but rather because it's it's precisely when we feel most at odds, most embattled or what have you, that if we can dig in and find a little more, 
it really shows us just actually what immense capacity there is inside of us. It's an encouraging thing that builds on itself. To just go according to stimulus and sensation, which again, that's the exact curse of our time. Stimulus, stimulus, stimulus. And one that drains us. You know, Susie was saying in her comment, quite insightful, you know, I, I used to have trouble sleeping. My brain was going all the time, you know, kind of hyper person. That's part of it. But part of it was also, if I put something off for a long time, I have a hard time ending my day because I'm mad. I'm mad at myself. I'm frustrated at the situation, right? And I don't want to give up. So going to sleep always feels like giving up. I don't fall asleep happy, satisfied. But when I work hard during the day, at the end of the day, you feel tired. You feel done. Not just that, but you feel proud. I think part of this is there's the practical element in the sense that there are things you need to do when you need to do them, even if you don't feel like it at the time because we have responsibilities for things outside of ourselves and it's not just based on our own personal preferences. But more than that, there's also what it means to witness oneself as capacious, as productive, as capable. And how then that builds a certain way of relating to yourself that feels more reliable. You build a trust, you build monus with yourself that you're someone in your own corner that you're your own ally, not your, not your enemy. We die from hunger because we see ourselves as empty. The cupboards of our soul are bare. Yeah, Renee. Oh, yeah, it's just like that story. Isn't there an Aesop story? The ant and the grasshopper. Mm -hmm. Where the ant, the ants are working hard and the grasshopper is so lazy. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, like, doesn't this also relate to our relationship with God in that, you know, even in a time when there doesn't seem to be much going on, like, we should still be preparing or, like, be like, you know, fertilizing the soil or doing something, you know, like even our, in like our, the quiet moments of our life, we, we don't really need, you know, Hashem, you know, nothing traumatic is happening. Nothing is, you know what I mean? It's just our, yeah. you know, everyday life is happening. Um, like so many times, you know, people don't really start praying until something traumatic happens. You know, until you have to like really dig in. Right. And you call your therapist when your life is spinning out of control, not when right, you want right. to like take a minute and think about what kind of life do I want to have. Right. But really, like the winter time is like the time to really to, to really do the work because um, you know I've heard so many therapists say like even in a marriage, the best time to work on your marriage is actually even before you're married. And the best time to, uh, you know, work on your parenting is before you're even a parent. Like, you know what I mean? Like, even like when you get pregnant, you start reading all these parenting books and like you're trying to get ready to be a parent. Mm -hmm. Like you so should really, you know, like not all of a sudden figure out how to be a parent, mm -hmm. um, you know, like. Right. Or, or, or like be in a relationship even like so. Right. Anyway, I think you understand but I'm. No, no, I think I think everyone yeah. hearing you can understand. What you're, I think it's a very, very insightful point. Um, yeah, that's why the question I asked here. I think you're really uh, intuiting exactly the, what I think. I hope Rabbi Niona is provoking is what is the winter plowing in our lives, right? That you know, the bottle person thinks in terms of immediate stimulus, right? I, 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 you know, he plants the seed and wants the harvest the next day. But he doesn't realize that life takes sustained effort, sustained attention. Not everything always pays off immediately. All right, we plant seeds, we tend them, they grow. Right? I think I mean, parenting is also a really important metaphor, analogy, 
right? You raise children, and eventually they become themselves, right? But that payoff, as it were, right? When they, I don't know, take care of your, your dotage, I suppose. Uh, you know, but really, when you see, like, a child that becomes an adult and has actualized themselves and is contributing to society and is positioning themselves to do for others what you have done for them, right? That's something that takes amount of time, right? Nothing happens immediately. But not just that also, but not, but it's not just that, but also that work itself is not just what produces results, but also there's something that you're getting at, Renee, which is hachana, preparation. Also kashrus in that way, like the word kosher doesn't mean, doesn't just mean fit, it means ready, right? To make something ready. Hachana, to prepare something, prepare yourself. Sometimes work is about exactly the periods in between in which you look and you take care, maintenance, just like what Adam Harishon had to do. Take care of the garden, keep it okay, right? After you've done something, to take care of yourself, to take care of what it is that needs to produce the work in the future. You know, do some work on the tractor in the garage, you know, type of thing, right? Make sure that you're, 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 you're working okay, right? That was really important work too. Um, and specifically, exactly when it's, you know, not something that's going to produce something immediately. And it takes a certain amount of security. And not just it takes a certain amount of security, but I think in a way it builds a certain amount of security. Okay. So, I wonder if actually it might be worth splitting this class into two because then we have the whole other, we have two other Mishnayas to get through. There's not as much material on it, but there's a, there's a pretty serious amount. All right, we'll see what, how we feel at the end of this uh, Midrash Shmuel. So the Midrash Shmuel says, Kavanas Ashal Emazeh, Lemar Shelo Ye Ohev Schar HaMalacha, Shinai Tel Asiyasa, Vesenei HaMalacha Atma, Vekatzba, Vesheu Tareach, Vyageyaba. Says, what this means, you know, in a general sense, is that a person shouldn't, a person should, sorry, should not, should not, love the paycheck, the reward you get for the work that you receive when you do the job, and hate the work itself, despising it while you're doing it, and striving, and striving, and, and toiling in it. Ella yesameach im hamlacha atzma. Rather, one should be happy with the work itself. Viehane viyismach beis asiyasa, and benefit and enjoy while you are doing it. Kiilu ena alav litoreach, or litorach, as if it's not really a burden, a trouble for the, for you. The Al Kaze Amru Razal, and about this the rabbi said, and he quotes something I couldn't exactly find. Gadol Hanehanami Yigia Yoser Miyare Shemaim. Greater is the one who finds satisfaction or benefits from their toil, better than the pious, the one who fears heaven. Okay, so. If we're just to, you know, boil it down, brass tacks, what's he getting at? It's an ideal, an idealistic image of sorts. What, should, what shouldn't one do? Yeah, Lauren? The satisfaction should be for the work you do. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's unrealistic to say you're not happy about the, you know, you want to be paid, you got to be paid, but it's the work that should satisfy you. And, and I mean, I can really relate to that. I I hated working in drugstores. I loved working in hospitals. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I had one job where I'd be sick to my stomach before going into work because my boss was a jerk. You know, everything about the job was obnoxious and it just schleps everything out of you. I mean, what you have to do is say, okay, this is not for me. I'm going to look for something where I really, the, where the work is, has meaning to me and where I love the work. Yeah. And, and I, I think it goes both ways. Like, spiritually, it destroys you. 
if if you hate what you're doing. It's just too much. Mm hmm. Right. So I think that's the thing is that this is an ideal that he's describing. And it's not, I think, like a tut tutting criticism of people who don't feel this way. Right. I think a lot of the big trouble right now is that a lot of work is very hard to find value in. And if you can't at the end uh, jobs are hard to find value in. Um, and if you're not able to, then, you know, like you feel bad about it. And in some ways it's designed to do that. It's designed to make you feel dehumanized, right? The whole like Fordist model in which, you know, workers are seen as something that you can swap out and replace with somebody, you know, and something that is becoming increasingly automated. Um, there is, there, there has been an ennobling quality to work, right? Or like even think of like high compensating positions out there, like, you know, law, business, whatever, right? Things that often require you to do terrible, nasty things. And you go home feeling terrible, you know, and you drink and, you know, mad men, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, here he, I think he's describing the way it should be, not the way that it is. And he said the way, hopefully, you know, our ethical system or value system shouldn't be valuing your compensation, right? It's not the paycheck that's the point. But rather, it's the work. It's the work that hopefully you're actually able to relate to directly, find value in immediately, right? Not just in its results, but even in the process. It's the working that's valuable. There's a wonderful book. Yeah, very much. You know, if you're just if it's just about if it's just about the result, then it is it feels like servitude, not like. I think there's something ennobling about labor that I've has been a through line. I'm trying to get through this. You know that, you know, a famously bearded Jew named Karl Marx. I right, talked about the alienation of labor. Right, that's one of the uh, the 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 real like tragedies of capitalism, right, is that you, the way the system is designed actually is to make you feel alienated from the from your product. You are a carpenter or something, you make something and then you have to sell it or, or it's owned by the person whose shop you're in and because of that then it feels like something that was yours was not really yours. And something feels like it's taken away from you. There's a lot more to be said about that. It's a very paltry description, but I think Midrash Shmuel is getting at something similar. If you see work only in terms of the results, then it's always going to be very tendentious. It's always going to be in some way insecure. But rather, if it's actually, if we're able to take our bodies and our spirits, our souls back, and actually reground work in the act itself, a skilled, you know, intentional activity, then there's something powerful about it. He says in the end, Ritzel Amar, it's not that you're benefiting from the paycheck. Right, that you get at the end of the job. No, you're actually enjoying the work itself, the working, the labor, the, oil, the, the effort, the toil. Think of expending yourself. Right, think of using all of yourself. Think of deploying yourself in a way that is energizing, not just enervating. Doing something and then, you know, feeling proud, feeling proud of yourself, feeling satisfied in the job that you've done. Not because someone else has told you it's good, but rather inside of it, not outside of it, at the end of it, or because of someone else's evaluation. It sells on Etsy or whatever but rather because the actual act was meaningful. It's a practice of sorts. And, and you rejoice in what is your portion, but I don't think he means be happy with the meager salary you get from, you know, the boss man. Love work, hate the, hate the boss. It's not about loving the paycheck. The paycheck comes from the boss. Loving work means loving yourself as a worker. Appreciating, valuing what you're able to accomplish, what, how you're able to contribute, what your body and soul can do, what your mind can do, what your heart can do, what your hands can do. 
I think the Sameach B'masha Chelka Eloi means be happy in what is your portion, Mina Shemai, from God. What is, it's not the money. It's you. You're the chilek. You're the portion. You're the paycheck, as it were. You are. I, you know, this Midrash Shmuel, which is mostly an anthology, but here he doesn't actually quote anybody. I think this is actually his actual comment. I think he's actually in his mind thinking of a notion in the Talmud that says, schar mitzvah mitzvah. The reward of the mitzvah is the mitzvah itself. And I think he's actually drawing that particular idea about how the mitzvah is inherently valuable to say that about work as well. Work is inherently valuable. Not jobs are inherently valuable. Often jobs, in a way, devalue work. But work itself, what your body and spirit and soul and mind and heart when working in concert are able to produce and achieve is a beautiful thing. And if you can free yourself from its revaluation or devaluation because of compensation or lack thereof, and rather reground yourself, recenter yourself in the elegance, the beauty, the exquisite quality of your capacity at work, your abilities at work. The conversation you had with a coworker to help them think through a problem. Sitting with a child to help them repair a relationship with a friend. Making something beautiful with your hands. Making a meal that feeds other people. Not even just in a way the smiles you get or the thank you cards or what have you, but really your hands as they dance across the countertop chopping the vegetables. Your heart as it reaches out for another when they need a listening ear. The work itself is sanctified. Every gradient of our emotion is a chance to do something beautiful. It's very much, I think, about intentionality, Susie. That's right. I think it's about the fact that everything we do has space for us to recognize, not to bring meaning to it, but rather recognize the meaning that's inside of it. So the Midrash Shmuel refuses to cede work, in a way, to the boss. Rather, the work is the workers. The things you do in your life are yours, and that's why he says at the end, L'hiyais Baal Milacha, to be a master of work, Baal, but I don't think that's right. To be a Baal Tshuva does not mean a master of Tshuva. A Baal Tfila does not mean a master of prayer. It means somebody who is defined by what it is that they do, i.e., someone defined by Tshuva. Someone defined by prayer. Someone who has become expert in it. To be a craftsperson. To be a skilled artisan. But not just of woodworking, farming, I mean those two, cooking, whatever. But of your life. That life is work. Life is a chance to do holy work. And the question is, can we free ourselves from thinking of work as job, i.e. as compensation, and rather remember, realize again, that work is prior to and other than any kind of recognition, but rather is the value of doing something valuable with your capabilities that you have been given by God. And what that's that's the ennobling question. Can we in a sense recognize the inherent nobility and dignity and value that is in us prior to any kind of external recognition? That's possible for anybody in any station of their life. Children work when they take care of their friends, when they recognize somebody who needs a hug when they paint something because they want to give something to someone they care about. Elders work when they take care of their grandkids. 
when they when they volunteer at their synagogue, when they sit and provide advice to people who need their life experience. Everyone works. The challenge that Midrash Shmuel and that Shemaya and all of these scholars have been saying is, can we re re realize and remember how much value and ability we have and what chance we have to use it? Uh, I think here is a good time to, let's say, put a pin in it. We'll get back to um, more thinking about work and that way maybe the consequences and ways to bring this in a sustainable way into our lives because one of the things is we think of like this kind of heroic, virtuosic kind of vision of work of like, oh, you never, never waste a minute, no bustle, you know, there's so much to do, don't give up, don't, don't be lazy, you know, it can be really overwhelming and how can we actually try to resist that sense of, let's say, an unsustainable model and incorporate into our lives. So we'll focus on one of the teachings of Lo'alecha Hamlacha Ligmor, right? It's not on you to finish the work, but how can we still stay committed to the practice? So we'll look at that next week. Um, we'll look at, if you want to do a little bit of prep, Hachana, I'll send you the source sheet, you can, you can get it ready. Uh, but if you want to look at an original, uh, you can find Pirkei Avot, chapter two, uh, the last two Mishnayot in the chapter. Okay, it's different orderings, different numbers, and different versions of it. It's either 15 to 16 or 21, 22, depending on. But the point is, chapter two, the last two mission I own the chapter. So do a little bit of prep, hachana, and we'll meet again, I think, next uh, Monday. And maybe even uh, Ellen and Eric might, uh, and Aaron might be part of the class in person. We'll see if I can uh, coerce them into it gently. Um, and uh, I hope to see you then. Um, we'll be having Parsha chat. Uh, I don't know which page is in the comic book. The last two Mishnahs in the second chapter. Figure it out. Um, and I'll see you Wednesday for Parsha chat. We'll be looking at Baloscha. Actually, there's a teaching I want to share from the uh, from the Svasemis. Actually, that's all about the uh, the importance and meaning of human action. Um, and uh, I'll see you this Shabbos, God willing, seven o'clock Friday night at Shul, 9.30, Shabbos morning, um, at Beth Lita. Have a wonderful week. Shavuot Tov.